All right. Good morning, B sides. I hope everyone is having a fantastic day. Uh, today, this morning, and this session, we have George Ortiz. Uh, he is the CTO of Scythe, and he's going to talk to us about operationalizing Purple Team. So thanks for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Pablo. And hello, everyone. Good morning. Oh, look at that. Jay Cran is here. I see Sina, uh, a.k.a. Cheerio. Hello, hello, hello. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you to B-Sides and the organizers for putting this together. It's so much work to run a conference. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. It's a new talk I've put together. So um, as we go through it, please give me feedback. I can see the chat. So I already saw uh, the first question there coming in from Sina. So that always makes me smile. And I'm also watching the Discord. This is fully live. Uh, so if you have questions, post them. And am looking forward to your feedback because whenever we release new stuff, we want to hear from you. See if you found it valuable. See if you're using it. And of course, how we can improve. So today's talk is about operationalizing the Purple Team. I've spent the last about year, year and a half talking about Purple Team exercises and bringing value. And a lot of organizations have done this. They, they ran their first exercise, which is awesome. But then I get the question, what now? Do we just wait and do another exercise or what, what do we do? And that is what I wanna talk to you about today. Thank you again for that brief introduction, Pablo. My name is George Orchillas. I am the Chief Technology Officer at Scythe. We are an organization, a startup that builds an adversary emulation platform. We love purple teaming. So been there exactly one year now, believe it or not. Anyone that's following me on Twitter and saw all that uh, go down. Um, also love contributing and giving back to the community, author, and contributor to the Purple Team Exercise Framework, the C2 Matrix. Spent 10 years in corporate America running the offensive security team at Citigroup. And I also teach at SANS. I'm actually teaching right now, believe it or not. Today's day six of Security 504. So it's the CTF day. Thankfully, I have an awesome uh, TA there watching uh, what's going on. And hopefully, I don't miss too much. But I'm here with you now. I'm very excited. And Let's just get to it, right? So one of the big things that we are talking about today is attack, detect, and respond, right? Working together to improve and evolve as the industry involves. I mean, we've all seen this happen, right? If you're new to InfoSec, welcome. You're coming at a, at a very interesting time where we're seeing humongous impact of these attacks all over the place, right? Uh, when the dry cleaner or Uber driver knows about a ransomware attack that occurred at Colonial or JBS, and they know that you're an infosec, they're like, what are you doing? How are we gonna help this, right? So I'm really big on leveraging threat intelligence, right? Understanding attack vectors. How are these attacks happening? Building from that cyber threat intelligence, making it actionable, and then attacking ourselves. I've been doing 10 years of offensive security uh, at an organization and we bring value, right? Because we are improving. We are trying to stay a step ahead of the attackers and fix and hopefully detect and respond much quicker before we are impacted. And of course, to do all that, we have to track our work. Long gone are the days where we all worked in little silos, writing O days, you know, full disclosure days are over, et cetera. We are all working together. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. So what does an InfoSec team look like today? Well, um, if you're wondering about these unicorns, these are the Scythe unicorns. They are awesome. Um, what we do is we have CTI teams, right? Many organizations have cyber threat intel teams, right? And they spend time going through and understanding attacks, grabbing indicators of compromise, grabbing attack behaviors, and they want their work to be actionable by various teams. We also have the red team that works across the organization, finding uh, vulnerabilities and uh, emulating behaviors that um, might or might not work in the organization. Essentially, they're attacking it before the malicious actors do. 
And then we have the blue teams. The blue teams are our defenders, right? They have a tough job. They're working in the security operations center. They're hunt teaming. They are doing uh, defer, digital forensics, and incident response. And they're in charge of making sure that if there is an attack, that they respond to it. And what we've been doing is bringing them together, right? Not operating in silos, working together in a purple team. And we started doing purple teaming and introducing purple teaming as a virtual team. This is a slide I've used before. And now I'm putting quotes around a purple team is a virtual team where the following teams work together. Cyber threat intelligence does the research, understands TTPs, provides them to the red and the blue team. The red team is in charge of emulating those TTPs. The blue team is in charge of ensuring they have detection and that they know how to respond to those behaviors. So through that, we published the Purple Team Exercise Framework. That, as you can see there, on the right starts with cyber threat intelligence. There's a lot of preparation because we want the most efficient use of your time. When we bring everyone together to sit through an exercise, we want it all to function, right? So lots of planning goes on, making sure we have target systems, target accounts we're gonna hit, make sure we have an adversary emulation plan, make sure there's an exercise coordinator, attendees, et cetera. Then we run the exercise, we see and learn what is working, what is not working, and of course we have lessons learned. So if you've never heard of a purple team exercise, I'm going to level you up very quickly as we get into the next step. So in an exercise, you have an exercise coordinator, they present an adversary that is likely to target your organization. They present TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, those behaviors and the technical details about it. Then you all work together, the red, the blue, the CTI teams, the attendees. Really interesting when you have senior management attendees because you bring up a TTP let's say downloading an ISO from the internet. What are the expected controls? And one might say, that's blocked, we wouldn't allow that. What about um, download or emailing an ISO? No, that's definitely blocked. Or no, that'll be caught by our proxy or that will be this, right? You have that discussion, you set expectations. The red team then takes that TTP and emulates it. Does, goes through and shows it on the screen learning opportunity for everyone there. How do attacks work? You're actually seeing it. Red team isn't working on their own over there in the corner and then giving you a report of things that work. No, they're showing it to you. Then the blue team, after seeing that attack, goes through and they follow their process. They look to see if there were any alerts, there was something that was logged here or there, and they share their screens. Again, another learning opportunity, this time for the red team to see how the blue team functions. And then if something didn't meet expectations or there are opportunities to improve, we do detection engineering. This is where you enable security controls, maybe enable a log, or maybe a log was already there, but there was no alert. You tune that. You want the alert to happen when the malicious activity occurs, but not when regular activity occurs. And then you repeat this throughout that day or that week, however long, your exercise is. And of course, you show value, right? You track all of this. You track the TTPs. And these TTPs are no longer something that is open or closed, right? Those are vulnerabilities. A vulnerability is patched or it's not patched. It was exploited or it wasn't exploited, right? Open, closed, very simple. With TTPs, we are doing behaviors that users can do. So sure, there's some blocked behaviors, but really what you need is for them to be logged and alerted. Sometimes you have no evidence. So you wanna track this. The image on the left comes from uh, one of our partners, PlexTrack, which is a reporting solution, tracking TTPs, no longer as open and closed, but actually as alerted and logged or not logged or blocked. And then on the right, you have Vector. Vector is a free tool that allows you also to track TTPs and shows you uh, how you improve over time. So that is a 10 minute or less intro to Purple Team Exercises. If you want to learn more about Purple Team Exercises, we have the Purple Team uh, Exercise Framework. It's free, you can download it. 
Um, and we're actually working on version two. So we've learned a lot running purple team exercises from the consultant perspective, because we go companies say, hey, purple teaming looks awesome. I've never done it. I don't know where to start. I read the framework, but can you help us? And yes, we, of course, can help you. So if you're interested in stuff, definitely let us know. Hit me up outside uh, of this talk. But if you want to do this on your own, download this framework and uh, check it out. So great. Intro's over. We finished our first exercise. High fives. Virtual double high five for all of you. What now? Well, now we need to operationalize this, right? We can do purple team exercises maybe once a month, once every two months, once every three months, et cetera, right? Periodically. But we know that we're going to get new TTPs discovered. We're going to see new attacks. And what do we do with all that other time, right? The red team goes and works in their silo again. The blue team goes and works in their silo. CTI goes, works in their silo. No, we want them to continually work together. One exercise is great, but to get that collaboration, it can't just be ad hoc. So we are going to operationalize that. And that is what we're going to talk about today. If you already have operationalized purple teaming, that is awesome. Where do we see this going? Dedicated purple team. As a, a group of people that have experience with cyber threat intelligence, with attack, and with detection and response. And they work together understanding threats and detections. It's a very tough job. You need experience, but through using a very simple steps like I've just shown here, going from a purple team exercise to operationalize to dedicated, you can get there too. So our focus today for this talk is how do we operationalize purple teaming as virtual teams working together? So we built a new cycle. The cycle starts when new CTI or TTPs are identified. And anyone can do this. It could be the cyber threat intelligence team that just read something new because they read every CTI report out there. They're on top of all of these attacks. It could be the red team. The red team should be focusing on finding new ways to do things. The red team should not be repeating TTPs over and over because you can automate that. The red team should be building new and finding new ways of doing attacks. Or the blue team might have found something. They're going through their day to day and they see, maybe the hunt team sees something. Hmm, this is interesting. I haven't seen this attack before. Anyone can provide and initiate this process, right? CTI red and blue working together. You send this out. Hey, check this out. Brand new CTI. Let's review it. Then you assign a CTI member, a red team member, a blue team member to work together. Then over on the right, step two, we are going to analyze and organize these TTPs. If it was a full attack, then we want to map that attack to MITRE attack. We want to correlate with previous test cases. Are these really new TTPs that we've never tested before? Or have we tested it? Maybe it's a new procedure. Is it the same procedure? If it's the same procedure and we feel we have coverage, we can verify that and your process can be over for the short term. But if it's new, then we need to have a tabletop discussion. This is how this attack works, according to the CTI. What is our expected detection and response? You have that conversation for the various TTPs. The red team will then understand the threat and emulate the attack. One of the things I'll show you all the way at the end is a purple team maturity model that covers deployment, integration, and creation as you mature through it. But the point here is the red team will emulate this attack while the blue team watches. Then the blue team will understand what detections they have. They will see if they need to create something new, if they need to integrate something, deploy something, and then repeat this. Once you do build out this new control, new method of finding something, then 
you have to repeat that same DTP while you train your people, right? SOC analysts, right? So far, we've only had three or four people working together. We want to inform the greater team. Let everyone in CTI know about this new CTI and how it currently affects the organization. Let everyone on the red team know this new attack method so that they add it to their library and add it to their automation. And then the blue team knows about this attack, knows that if they get an alert, what to do about it. So that is what we're gonna go through here. And if you've ever gone to my talks, you know I like being very practical. So let's get to it. Step one, new cyber threat intelligence comes in, right? In this case, CTI read this new email, this new blog post from Microsoft's Threat Intelligence Center, a new sophisticated email-based attack from Nobelium. CTI team reads this, says, huh, it's interesting. Let me share this with our virtual purple team. Email goes out, or you do it through a ticketing system, a tracking system, wherever you can implement this. I've seen it done in Jira. I've seen it done in Archer. We can do it in a number of different places. The point is notify the virtual uh, purple team. Let them know, hey, Microsoft, Thursday, this one was Thursday afternoon. Uh, their second one was on Friday afternoon, right before Memorial Day, right? Always comes in at that time, right? We can't get something on, I don't know, a Monday afternoon. No, it always has to drop at the end of the week, right? So we assign, whether it's self-assigned or manager assigned, be like, oh, this looks cool. I'll take it. I'll be the red teamer that's going to take it. The blue teamer says, all right, I'll take this one. And of course, the CTI person that found this will be involved. So what do we have? We are going to initiate our purple team. Sorry, I couldn't keep a straight face on that one. So a little comic relief there. We get together. Now we need to do step two, analyze and organize these TTPs. What did we see? Well, we have to read through this dense CTI report. We need to extract the TTPs. We need to map them to MITRE ATT&CK. And then we need to correlate with previous tests. So let's take a look. If you haven't heard of this uh, attack, this was um, Microsoft found this. Essentially, uh, this group, this threat actor, compromised the constant contact of USAID. USAID is a legitimate organization. Constant Contact is a legitimate email sending provider. They are used to sending newsletters and emails to people that subscribe. So you, people that were interested in USAID have subscribed to USAID. They are receiving newsletters from them all the time. The threat actor compromised their, uh, their Constant Contact account, essentially allowing them to build an email and send it to legitimate users that are used to and expect to receive emails from them. They get this email and it says view documents. What happens next? Well, it was a spear phishing email. It had an attached HTML that performed HTML smuggling. That HTML smuggling attack downloaded an ISO file. That ISO file had a malicious link, a shortcut file that then ran a DLL, and there was also a decoy file in there. So if we look at another screenshot here, we see it loaded an image called DE class, all in uppercase. It had the documents.dll file. It had an ICA-dclass.pdf. This is a decoy. This is a real PDF file. And there's a shortcut there called reports. If someone double clicked the shortcut, it would execute the DLL. So if we look at the shortcut, we see it was running this DLL and opening it and essentially launching the command and control payload and establishing a connection to some server. So thankfully, this particular article this particular CTI had MITRE ATT&CK mapping. Now, 
when we do MITRE attack mapping, one, it's good to see it in reports, but we're really looking for the procedure level, right? So in this case, initial access tagged to spear phishing via service. Nubelium used the legitimate mass mailing service content, constant contact to send their email. Yep. In that email, there was a URL. So there was a link that they clicked on it. So that's T1566. Excellent. And then Microsoft um, decided to tag execution as T1610. Deploy container. A payload is delivered via an ISO file, which is mounted on a target computer. I looked at this one and I thought, this, this isn't right. Deploy container is more about deploying Docker containers. So what do we do? We go on the MITRE attack Slack, right? Are you all part of MITRE attack Slack? You definitely should. We have awesome conversations there. Some of those conversations lead to very fun polls on Twitter. So we debate this, whether is this deploy container or not? And we reach the conclusion it's not. Actually putting a payload in an ISO file is a bypass of Mark of the Web. So even though this is amazing CTI provided by Microsoft, a top security company, amongst other things, the mapping might still not be correct, right? And there's biases around here. There's great papers around this. And this is why you need multiple people working together because someone could have detected this. But let's move on. Then user execution, malicious link. The user double clicked on a shortcut file. And then application layer uh, for command and control, DLL connecting over HTTPS. Fantastic. Now let's analyze and organize this for our pleasure. I like building little tables. They're easy to read. So description of this, Nubelium, the Russian threat actor behind the SolarWinds comp, uh, attack, compromised constant contact to send malicious emails with a weaponized ISO file. Resource development. This wasn't tagged before. Resource development is a new MITRE attack tactic, right? It came from pre-attack and essentially we mapped it to T1584006, which is compromise infrastructure, a web service. So it compromised constant contact to then do spear phishing via service, constant contact, spear phishing a link, a link that downloads and does HTML smuggling, and then defense evasion, T1553.005. This is actually the correct mapping of using an ISO image because an ISO image is not an NTFS file. So it's not marked with mark of the web. What is mark of the web? When you download something from the internet and you try to execute it, you generally get the smart screen pop up that says, hey, this is bad. I'll demo that for you uh, right now if, uh, when we get to a demo. And then it actually ran run DLL 32 to execute that DLL and it was executed, of course, when the user double clicked a malicious file, a Windows Explorer shortcut. So this is also a small deviation from the CTI's attack mapping. And then command and control wasn't only application layer, but it also used an encrypted channel. So you can see that something net new can have multiple TTPs for us to take a look at. So we have and we look at this and say, is there anything new, anything we haven't tested before? Well, Constant Contact is an email service that people subscribe to. We've never used that to deliver phishing emails. Then we have that hard discussion of, can we even emulate that? Can we hack into Constant Contact and send emails from there? Or maybe MailChimp or maybe some other email provider? Probably not, right? Maybe we can simulate this some way, maybe work with them, but this is gonna be a, a lot tougher conversation to have. We'll give that to our managers, let them deal with it. What we can do is take a look at T1553005. This is subvert trust controls, mark of the web bypass with an ISO image. So essentially, if we create an ISO image and we host it on the internet, when you download that image, you're able to execute it without any other control saying, hey, stop, what are you doing? Something bad might happen. So we can then inside of that ISO include a shortcut 
that executes a DLL via run DLL 32. We've done that one before, right? Run DLL 32 is used by like every single ransomware threat actor, right? But we can test that too. And have we tested this before? Well, we've tested run DLL 32 before, but we haven't tested downloading an ISO image from the internet that's weaponized. This is net new to me. I'm sure there might have been some other CTI out there. That's where you ask the CTI team, hey, can you check into this while we build a test case? So what do you do for a test case you've never done? You do some research. What's a great place to start? Atomic Red Team, right? Atomic Red Team has a bunch of atomic tests, a great starting point to see if there's a quick test you can do. And unfortunately, there wasn't an atomic test for this. So this is a perfect candidate for our purple team. Step three, let's tabletop this. Now, we know that this was an ISO downloaded from a browser on an internet site. What kind of expected detection and response would we have here? Well, are we allowing ISO downloads on the browser? Is our proxy detecting that an ISO file is being downloaded? And can we block it? Or maybe our next gen firewall can see this. It's a good test case. What about if someone's hosting a malicious ISO file internally? Will the browser block that from being downloaded since we, it wouldn't be going through proxies or next gen firewalls? Have to see it. I don't know. Do you know? Do you know if in your organization you're blocking ISOs at the browser level? And then we also think about a little more test cases. This was also an email. What if the ISO file came as an attachment on that email? Have we tested that? Well, maybe our external security provider blocks ISO and .image files coming from the outside. We're gonna have to check. But what about internal? What if someone internally sends an ISO file that is malicious? Would Outlook email allow that? Will our endpoint security allow that? Would the email server, the security on the email server allow it? I don't know. What about mounting the ISO? Do we have any detection for that? How often do, do end users mount ISOs? Probably never, right? I can see an IT administrator mounting an ISO, but our end users, do we detect this? And then, of course, execution from an ISO. I don't know. What about unmounting the ISO? So you have this discussion. Of course, I just did this role playing here on my head on what I think most organizations would answer. But your organization is different. You see the CTI. You have to sit and think through these test cases. So step four, let's create an ISO. How do you create an ISO? a great question. I mean, I remember back in the day we would create ISOs and you can create a Windows 10 ISO with that little Windows 10 thing. But how else can we do it? Well, I use Twitter and I want to give a shout out to Matt Grabber, Matt Festation, definitely worth following. And very quickly, Matt wrote something on Twitter that, that made a lot of sense. Adversaries choose ISO and image as delivery vector because smart screen doesn't apply because it's a non-NTFS volume. Good, that's very good technical detail. In this test, he created an ISO that has an e a hello.exe. If you click and load it, it won't get prompted. So thank you, Matt. That was an awesome test case. Then did some more work. My friends over at Outflank, Mark Smee and the whole team there had an article back in March about the mark of the web and getting um, around this. And then at Scythe, I actually had talked about this, talking about defense evasion, because when you download an executable from the internet, you have the mark of the web. So we had a nice place to start, but I wanna emulate the entire attack. So sorry for this slide that has a lot of words, but this is the attack. We set up command and control using HTTPS on 443, and we generate a DLL payload. If you're not familiar with how to do this first step, check out the C2 matrix, howto.thec2matrix.com. You can download a virtual machine that I built with SANS. You can get up and running, set up a C2, 
and create a DLL payload in a variety of C2 frameworks, many of them. Empire, Covenant, Mythic, right? All of these allow it, right? Not the scope of this talk. What we want to focus on is how do we build this ISO and weaponize it? Well, I went online and found multiple ways of doing this. And in particular, I used the Folder to ISO project. So shout out to them. Again, not my work. Folder to ISO is someone else's. Shout out to them. We are working together. And I hosted this up on our GitHub. You then copy and rename this DLL that you created in step one, documents.dll, and you put it in the folder to ISO working directory. Then in the folder to ISO working directory, you're going to create a short call called, called reports and set the target to run DLL32, documents.dll, and the entry point. Then from a command prompt, because I like doing everything on a command prompt, even though folder to ISO is a GUI app, on one liner, folder to ISO, take everything in the folder to ISO and build out T1553.005.iso, and we're gonna call it the same, D class. And then you have to add some other parameters there. Now we deliver this ISO, we host it on a web server, we send it as a phishing link, all the different test cases we talked about. Then when someone downloads this ISO, you can either double click it, or you can mount it with PowerShell. And you see, I do a lot of things on command line, You'll, we'll get to that in a minute. And then once it's mounted, double click the shortcuts and see if this works. Now, of course, I documented all of this because it's all about giving back, right? So demo time. Let's pray to some demo gods. Quick, uh, quick uh, item there. So I'm going to use Scythe. This is not a sales pitch. I am literally just doing this for B-Sides San Antonio because this is the easiest way for me to create a DLL. I literally click next three times and we start a campaign. We then download this DLL, select the DLL, download the DLL. Yes, keep that and we're done. That's it. Now, next steps, what do we do? Well, we follow the community threats page that explains what to do. We grab this DLL and we need to rename it to, I'm going to copy and paste because if this doesn't work, it's because I fat fingered something, not because it doesn't work. Documents.dll. We're going to cut that and put it in this folder. So this source folder, you can clone from GitHub. You go into folder.iso and you put it here. Now my decoy PDF is actually the CIS security controls version eight that just came out. So you have uh, some good decoys there. Then we look at this reports uh, shortcut. We go to properties and we take a look there. What it's going to do, it's going to execute run DLL 32, yep, on documents.dll with its entry point, perfect. Let's actually rename this to DLL in uppercase. I don't think it makes a difference, but I'm not taking chances on live demos. So the next step, follow my uh, items here. We run folder to ISO, take everything in folder to ISO, put it into this ISO file and call it D class. Hit enter and it's gonna build my ISO. So over here, we have an ISO, look at that, not too big, 1.4 megs. Now we host this somewhere, right? Let's simulate that because ain't nobody got time for that. And then we go on to another machine. This is called Sky. And I actually need to delete this one because that was my test. So let's assume that someone just downloaded this brand new file. It's now on the downloads folder. Because it's an ISO, we can't mark it as mark of the web. Normally down here, it would say this came from the internet. It's not. Now there's multiple ways for us to mount this. We can mount this with PowerShell or we can just double click it, right? A normal user and how the US aid attack worked is they double clicked it. So we double click this and it automatically mounts and takes us right here. And if the user falls for it, they double click this report, nothing happens. 
you say, huh, that's weird. Well, let's take a look at something else. Let's open up this file. Oh, look, the CIS controls, that's pretty cool. And nothing happens, nothing else happens. We are like, all right, that's cool. We go back over to our attacker machine and there we have our callback. We have our shell over HTTPS, just how we created it. And we run a little who am I just to prove that we are on that machine and we get the response back. I think I saw a five second callback. So in a couple seconds, there you go. We got it working. Fantastic. Let's get back to our slides. So we ran the test. We ran the test and it was successful. So what hypothesis do we have? Well, we have to do detection engineering now. We would have, if I had time, only have six seconds. So I'm gonna speak a lot faster. So detection engineering, this is the part where now we know that this attack worked. That machine I ran this on had all AV, had everything. Clearly it bypassed smart screen, bypassed all our detections. So what hypothesis do we have? Well, an ISO file downloaded from the internet by a non-IT user is suspicious. An ISO file sent via email is suspicious. An ISO mounted is suspicious on, on any user's machine that's not an IT user. Process execution from a mounted drive is suspicious and a network connection from a process that runs from a mounted drive is suspicious. I wanna give out a shout out to Cyber Monk. He wrote an awesome post on detecting uh, these ISO images. It was a two part post. So shout out to him, reached out to him on Twitter, asked him, hey, can I show you some of this work? And of course they said yes, so cheers to you. Another shout out to Randy. Randy wrote some cool uh, detections here. This is Sysmon on Sentinel, but not everyone has that, right? Maybe you have something else. Well, let's look at what we got. Where was this logged? Did the proxy see an ISO being downloaded? If we would have sent this ISO in an email, would it have gotten through? Did we have visibility? Does the email server see that? Can we block that extension? What about antivirus? Antivirus doesn't catch anything, right? EDR, well, depends on your EDR. This is why you have to test. You can't just plug in your EDR and say, yeah, we're safe. Millions of dollars spent, we're good. No, you need to train your people. You need to tune as new things come out. Hopefully you have at least this log. The EDR does a great job at logging this stuff, but why isn't there an alert? Can we create an alert? And Sysmon, you can detect some of these behaviors on Sysmon. It's actually what uh, Randy did over here. And then of course you need to send these logs. You have to send them somewhere. If it's an EDR, generally it's already being sent. If it's Sysmon, you have to send that Sysmon uh, alert as well, uh, log, and then you need to create alerts. Once you create the alerts, you then train your people because detection isn't just an alert, is someone seeing this and saying, oh, we just got an alert that this endpoint in the accounting department just downloaded and mounted an ISO. Probably something we need to look into or better yet, try to block it, right? Only allow certain people to download these types of files, right? Different things, different ideas, all recommendations. And then of course, what is the response? So as I did this testing, I had started with Atomic Red Team. There was no Atomic test for this. So I built one. I give a shout out to Carrie Roberts, who uh, is super patient with my terrible ability of creating Atomic tests. Adam Machinchi, who runs the uh, Red Team, uh, the Atomic Red Team and the open source stuff at Red Canary. And of course, Red Canary, who uh, are the ones supporting Atomic Red Team. So built this out on Atomic Red Team, did a bit of testing. So now you can do that test. Now that test is a little different. If we take a look at that test, what does this test do? Well, we actually created two atomic tests. One mounts the ISO, the second one mounts the ISO and runs the executable. So now you, without having to set up a C2 or anything like that, can come here 
and use this atomic test. It has a prereq command where it's going to download this ISO. This ISO that's on Atomic Red Team is not weaponized. It's not weaponized. It does not have a DLL. It does have a shortcut, but the shortcut doesn't execute anything. So you download that shortcut, that ISO file, and then you can actually mount it through PowerShell. You can then dismount it. Atomic Test 2 uses that, that executable created by Matt station so same initial steps you download this iso called feel the burn you then mount it and of course this one has to because you're going to run something in there you have to determine the drive letter when you mount an iso the drive letter that mounts is going to be different on every host depending on how many drives they have so it grabs the, dr the drive letter and then it executes that hello.exe you then of course can dismount it and stop the process. So now anyone that wants to test this can easily test this without weaponizing the whole thing. If you're a red teamer though, of course you wanna we weaponize the entire thing. So if you wanna follow step-by-step -step how to do this, it's obviously on the slide, but I've also posted it in our Scythe Community Threats GitHub, which are just that, community threats, number of attack chains that you can use to test yourself. Some of them require sites, some of them you can do manually. This one you can do manually. Of course, the step one, we cover how to do it with site. You can do it with any other C2. How to dot the C2 matrix has abundance of resources for you to do that. And last few things, what happens next? You have operationalized this, new TTPs come out, you check them. Eventually, we are seeing organizations building dedicated purple teamers. So I always said that this was a virtual team, but in talking to some of our more mature clients, they are actually building and having a dedicated team. So the red team still focuses on building new stuff. The blue team focuses on uh, detections. And this dedicated purple team works on looking at these new items. Of course, you still operationalize this. You're still bringing red and blue together, but their main thing is to understand threats, understand the attack and understand the detection. So this purple team maturity model was created by Tim Schultz, who works with me at Scythe. He's our adversary emulation lead and it was presented at the purple team summit. So essentially your purple team, your people need to have a threat understanding and a detection understanding. And as you build that out, you have deployment, integration, and creation that you do for each attack and each detection. Something I try to do here as a virtual team, but of course, uh, better have the dedicated team. Now, if you want more content, we love giving back to the community, and that's we, everyone at Scythe, uh, the unicorn. So we have a Threat Thursday blog. There we look at bigger threats of full attack chains, we understand the attack, the adversary, we consume cyber threat intelligence, we map it to MITRE attack if it's not already done, we release adversary emulation plans in JSON for attack navigator, as well as for Scythe, we emulate the adversary, and we then do detection and response, and it's all available for free for you to see on our blog. So references, like I said, I did not do all of this on my own. Shout out to Microsoft, who was the original cyber threat intel on this. Matt Fistation for showing uh, a brief proof of concept. Randy uh, from uh, Binary Defense. Uh, he was pretty much my blue teamer here, building out some detections for this. Um, so shout out to, to Randy. Um, and what else? Red Canary, of course. Red Canary and the uh, detection blog as well. So all these references, like I said, didn't do this on my own. We are a herd. We all work together. We have to collaborate. And with that, I think I did it right on time. Uh, so I want to thank you for yours. And we'll take any questions that you have. Thank you again. What a fantastic presentation, George. I appreciate you taking the time today. So many resources within your presentation today. It's fantastic. Do you plan on sharing that in Discord? Yes, I actually, I'm going to plan, share the references. 
I am going to hold off on the slides because I'm actually presenting this at Wild West Hackfest on Thursday. So you all oh, got it okay. here first for coming to B-Sides, but I'm going to present it there. I want to kind of maintain it uh, that way. I know we had smaller audience here. Um, so yeah, do want your feedback though, because bigger presentation there. Um, and yeah, you, you all got to hear it first. So let me know how it was, if you enjoyed it, if anything I can improve. Uh, it's the first run I did, so the timing was a little off. I want to spend a little bit more on detection engineering, showing some of the Sysmon uh, logs that show up and whatnot. But I know uh, I know what I got to work on. And uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll share the resources, though, of course, 100%. I'll post those uh, in the Discord right now. George, uh, I think uh, looking through the Discord chats during the session, you got positive, positive feedback. Everyone loves the energy uh, that you provided this morning. So great, great stuff. Uh, regarding, there's a question in the chat here, will the recordings uh, be available? Uh, I believe if George uh, accepted the um, uh, the ability to share the sessions, then those those recordings will be available after the con. So thanks again, George. I think you're going to join us on Discord, if I'm not mistaken, right? To uh, I am in, in the breakout session. What is your handle, just in case uh, some of the audience doesn't know and they want to reach out? At my name at Jorge Orchides, J O R G E O R C H I L L E S. Um, I'm currently in track three in the clouds. So thank you for those tags there. I see Cheerio. I see uh, Volunteer Hoop. Uh, but yeah, you can send me a direct message. Uh, don't be afraid. I do not bite. Um, and or post it publicly, however you want. Uh, we're here. And let's continue this conversation. I, this test case, I purple teamed via Twitter uh, with Matt Festation and Randy, um, who are you know very good detection uh, engineers. So uh, so let's continue the, the, the discussion and and uh, hopefully we can all connect and work together. We're a herd. Yeah. And I'm a hacker. I'm also a security researcher and an advocate for hacking is not a crime. And I'd like to share with you what being a hacker means to me. Because you see, since I was a young, young child, I've always been a hacker. I was the kid that liked to take my toys apart to figure out how they worked and to see if I could make them work better. When I turned 12 years old, I got a job. I saved up enough money and I bought myself my own computer. And on that computer, I wiped it clean, started from scratch, figured out how to build it from the ground up, learned programming so that I could write my own software to run on my computer. I learned modem communications and serial communications so that I could figure out how these online services that I like to use were working. And so when I got into my career, I took a lot of different twists and turns. I started off as a penetration tester. I moved into consulting. I worked at high executive levels, building massive application security programs across large enterprise organizations. I worked for product companies and resellers. But through it all, the one thing that stuck with me was this identity of being a hacker. Now, we hear the word hacker thrown about in the media, and it's usually connected with some type of criminal activity. But being a hacker does not mean being a criminal. Being a hacker is all about this innate curiosity, this passion to understand how things work and to see how we can make them work differently, better, create new things. I'm reminded of a quote from a keynote given by Jason Street, one of my colleagues, in which he said, hackers are inventors and creators, not criminals and freaks. And that's the reality. Hackers are people who wanna make technology better. We wanna make it do cool new things. We wanna understand how it works so that we can innovate, we can make things better, and we can make our lives all the more exciting through technology. So I hope you'll join with me and with Hacking is Not a Crime to spread the message that hacking and being a hacker is not a crime. We're not criminals. We're artists and inventors. Thank you so much.